Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken, Of those whom thou gavest me I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This is the reading of the arrest of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you can, please imagine with me the records of a court trial of 1973 being excavated some 2,000 years from now and being re-examined and in an effort to determine again the nature of the trial. There have been many excavations of such records in archaeology and these records have dealt with various subjects but had they dealt with a man's life it would have been altogether proper And I suspect inevitable that the question would be burning in the minds of the investigators, what was the real issue against this man? What was the real case against the prisoner? And so it was in the life of Jesus Christ. We find that in his life, the evidence and the records that were uh, preserved, we find in them sufficient uh, evidence and sufficient writings by which we can know the real case against the prisoner. In the life of Christ and in his trial, there were two crises or two major parts of the trial. One of them was the trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, which in effect was the trial before his own people. And then a second, and the critical part, I guess, if either one could be more critical than the other, was the trial before Pilate, which represented the official court before whom Jesus had to stand because of the powerlessness of the Jewish court. Uh, The Jewish court had no power to pass a death sentence. So it was essential that Jesus experience two uh, mock trials, if you please. But the final one by the Romans was essential to the death sentence. Let's go back, if you will, and pick up the, the strain or the thread of the events that took place on that final Thursday night before his crucifixion on Friday. It was late on the Thursday evening. I suspect that the arrest of Jesus in the garden could not have taken place earlier than about 11.30 p.m. You see, the Passover supper could not have been eaten, according to law, until after sundown on Thursday. And so it was that the record says that it was after sundown that Jesus and his disciples came from Bethany into the city of Jerusalem One or two of the disciples had been sent earlier that day to make preparation for the feast. And the feast probably then began around 6.30 or 7 o'clock after sundown. How long it took them to eat, we don't know. But there was also, after the supper or in the course of the supper, there was the washing of the disciples' feet. And how long that took, we don't know, but it took a while for one man to wash the feet of twelve men. And then in addition to that, there was the lengthy discourse in chapters 13 and 14 of John's Gospel. And how long that took in its actual setting, we don't know. But after the account that's recorded in in, uh, John the 13th and 14th chapters, Jesus and his disciples left the upper room 
and went out of there on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is found in the last verse of chapter 14, after Jesus finished his uh, speaking to them about the Comforter. Jesus says, Arise and let us go hence. And evidently they did. The next three chapters, 15, 16, and 17, take place not in the upper room, but on the way from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he talks there about being the true vine and many other things that he discusses as they're on their way from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. The 18th chapter in verse 1 gives us to understand that it was after Jesus finished all these sayings of the preceding three chapters, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Once having arrived in the garden, John does not record the period of travail and sorrow that Jesus experienced in the garden. We'll have to turn to the, uh, to the synoptics in order to get that detail. But when we turn to the synoptics, we find, as you are familiar with, we find the threefold prayer of the Lord. He and Peter, James, and John left the major part of the disciples and went on a stone's throw or so away. And then he went on another short distance away and began praying. He made this special appeal to God three times. Let this cup pass away from me. If it be your will, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he prayed this prayer three times, each time returning to his disciples, and each time finding these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, fast asleep. On the third occasion, when he returned and was talking with them, and it seems was hurt and disappointed that they could not at least watch with him one hour. As he was talking with them, he noticed coming across the Kidron Valley, Mark records it in the 14th chapter, he noticed the torches of those who were coming, the soldiers and the mob, uh, that Judas was leading, and he even, Mark says, pointed it out to the three disciples and says, look, here comes my uh, betrayer. And so that was the setting where we find the arrest of the Lord. John records this very unusual incident where uh, these people came and said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus asked them, he went out and said, uh, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And why, I don't particularly know, but there's this unusual rec uh, recording here that the men who came after him all fell backward and they fell all of them on the ground. I think it was because they were afraid of him. And the men who were closest to the Lord, perhaps, you know, dodging, for, afraid that something would happen or that he would uh, lash out and just they had heard such tremendous things about him and his reputation was fantastic. And I don't doubt but what they were just literally mortally afraid. And they fell back and probably stepped on the feet of the men behind them and the whole lot of them, just like dominoes, all fell back on the ground. And he asked them again, he said, who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I told you I am he, and if you want me, then let these men go. And so the other disciples, or all of the disciples, fled. Even John Mark, one of the uh, later disciples, he wasn't one of the twelve, but he was there and left his uh, linen tunic and fled naked, just literally scared to death that he was going to be arrested. But that's what happened, and then they arrested the Lord. They tied him, bound him up, and led him away like a common uh, criminal. There were two routes from the Garden of Gethsemane into the city of Jerusalem to Caiaphas' palace. And I'm going to ask, if you will, this, the balcony, we'll let that represent the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. And that's, if you'll think of it as looking toward the west, you're in the east, you're the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. You're in the Kidron Valley here in the main auditorium downstairs. This would be recognized as the temple. This would be recognized as the pavement where Christ was tried before Pilate, the Gabbatha. This would be recognized over here as the uh, palace of Caiaphas. And directly behind me would be the regal palace or the palace of Herod. And this is the general layout of this whole arrangement. The whole scene is laid out in this way, and you can get an idea about the arrangement of it from what I've said just now. There were two routes that could be taken from the Garden of Gethsemane on Mount Olives to the place where he was tried at, at Caiaphas' palace. One was to follow the main road from Bethany and go north through the Tyropian Valley and what is called or New, was called Newtown, and on up past the Herodian palace, and on down then toward the, to the palace of Caiaphas. The other was a shorter, more secret route, 
that started back over in the Garden of Gethsemane but went to the Pool of Siloam. And from the Pool of Siloam, through the gate, there was a stairway that led up through the old city of David and came directly up into the upper city where the uh, palace of Caiaphas was located. And more than likely, because of its secrecy and because of its being the shorter route of the two, I suspect that that was the route that they took Jesus as they led him away to be tried before Caiaphas. The trial before Caiaphas took place in the wee hours of the morning. We don't know exactly when, but if the arrest of Jesus took place around 11.30, it was after midnight by the time they came to the house of Caiaphas for the trial. There were many charges brought against the Lord before Caiaphas. There was what you might call a preliminary hearing, at which time the witnesses that had been secured and the house of Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, they more or less had a public hearing, a preliminary hearing, where they tried to make the case against the Lord solid so that they could actually bring him to trial before the Sanhedrin. Matthew in the 26th chapter and Mark in the 14th chapter mentioned that the priests and that the entire council tried to secure false witnesses against Jesus. But it says they found none, even though many false witnesses came. This is a bit unusual. If many false witnesses came and yet they found no one that would be as a, uh, served as a, uh, that would serve as a false witness, what was the problem? Well, Mark answers the question when he says that there was no agreement between the witnesses, or there were a lot of false witnesses that came, but the Jewish law said that there had to be a corroborating, uh, substantiating witness, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses everything would be established. And once they would get something established from the mouth of a false witness, then whatever corroborating evidence that they had would blow holes in it and there would not be the, it would be, it would be rendered useless. So they tried back and forth, maybe for some hours, I don't know, trying to get a case that would be watertight against the Lord, but they couldn't. But there came then some evidence by a few people that came and said something that if it were proved against the Lord, it would be sufficient evidence to bring him the death penalty on the grounds of blasphemy and sorcery. And it was this thing that he said about the temple while he was in the temple. Or oh, the reason why it didn't go through itself was that there was no agreement. Now, Matthew and Mark record this uh, disparity. They record the differentiation or the difference between what one witness said and another witness. And the writer Matthew, I think it is, or perhaps Mark, says that there was no agreement. There, there, was, there was a disparity between the, what the witnesses said. For example, in Mark, Mark records that segment of the witnesses who said that Jesus said, I will destroy the temple and raise it in three days. But Matthew records it and says, and records those witnesses that said, that said not that I would destroy it or will, but he said, I am able to destroy it. And there was that much difference that when it became public, that here they were, what they thought was their witness and what they thought was their case began to fall apart because there was this conflict between what some of them said and what others of them said to the point that the whole case seemed to be falling apart uh, in their face. And at that point, at that point, of course, what they were saying was what they were recording or reporting falsely what Jesus Christ had actually said back in John the second chapter after he had uh, cleaned the temple out and they said, what, are, what sign do you show? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, of course, they would have said that's blasphemy when he talked about the temple and to raise it up in three days was sorcery. You couldn't have raised something up in three days that had already take 40, uh, taken 46 years to build and was still in the process of building. So had he been proved to have said this, it would have been a uh, sufficient cause for his death being uh, signaled on either one of these charges, that of sorcery or blasphemy. But then this man Caiaphas was not one to be outdone. When the case seemed to be just literally falling apart, Caiaphas took charge and stood up and threw to the wind all pretense of legality. The trial itself was illegal from the start. It was illegal in the, in the uh, manner in which the arrest was made. And I'm not quite clear on why it was so illegal for the court officers or the, the army or the arresting officers, why it was illegal for them to go and arrest the man themselves, why, it had to be brought, why he had to be brought in by the witnesses, I don't know. But there seems to have been a flaw or a bit of illegality there. Second, it was illegal to try a man for his life after sundown. The only trial that could be uh, conducted, I'm told, as I've read, was a trial regarding money and lawsuits regarding money and less important things, but never a trial of a capital nature. It could not be conducted except in the daytime. 
But a third thing was that once the witness, uh, the testimony of the witnesses had fallen through, and once it had been proven that the witness of these people was not reliable and that it was actually false testimony, the prisoner could not, by law, be cross-examined by the court. It was against the uh, Jewish law for that to be done. But Caiaphas, I suspect, and perhaps there had been precedent for this flinging to the wind, uh, this legality, I don't know. But whether with precedent or without precedent, Caiaphas turned to the Lord and began to serve as the chief prosecutor for the court and began to cross-examine Jesus Christ. And he began this direct confrontation of the Lord, contrary to Jewish law. And he just simply said to him, Do you have nothing to say for yourself? What is it that these men are witnessing against you? And Jesus Christ would say nothing. He just stood there. Caiaphas then, perhaps, and you can almost see the, the blood vessels and the veins in his face and his face flushing, as he turned to the Lord and said, I adjure you in the name of the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ. And he here administers the great oath of the covenant, the most serious oath in the Jewish constitution. And it, the Mishnah says of it that if anyone says to you, I adjure you by the name of the living God, he says, the Mishnah says, you are bound to answer that. You cannot remain silent. So, though illegal it was, Caiaphas turned to the Lord and said, Tell us, by the name of the living God, I adjure you, tell us if you're the Christ. So if he answered it, he was in trouble. If he didn't answer it, he was in trouble. He knew who he was. But to make that claim before this audience meant that he would lose his life. And yet the oath of the covenant or the oath of the testimony was so serious that to refrain from answering it was also a breach, and I think it also carried with it a death penalty. At least it caused the person to be guilty whether he answered or whether he didn't answer. And so Jesus just answered the question. He said, I am the Christ. And Matthew and Mark and Luke, all three, record this statement, I am. And he said, not only that, you'll, from henceforth you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, when this answer was given, and all three of the answers, though they were differing somewhat as they are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they differ in intensity. Mark, the most brief of them all, just states what all of them meant when he said, I am the Christ, I am. And others said, you've said that I am, you say that I am, but Mark says, I am. He records the Lord as saying that. And then Bedlam broke loose, and you can just imagine all the rumblings and all the murmurings and all the gaspings. And then this hypocrite stood up there, Caiaphas, and tore his garments and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? We've heard him with our own ears. What's your, what's your sentence? What do you think? And they said, He's guilty of blasphemy. He's worthy of death. And so they concluded the preliminary trial, the trial before the Sanhedrin, with this sentence, The man is worthy of death as a blasphemer. And then Mark, the 15th chapter in verse 1, says that they conducted a brief caucus. They stood Jesus there and they went aside for a huddle, a legal huddle. They got together and had this caucus and then it says they led the Lord away to be tried by Pilate. The trial by Pilate took place about, oh, about 5 o'clock in the morning. You see, in John, the 19th chapter in verse 14, after the trial before Pilate was just, when it was just about finished, John says it was about 6 o'clock. About six o'clock, when the trial before Pilate had already just about finished, that meant that in order for them to have gotten from the house of Caiaphas over to the pavement where the Lord was tried, they would have had to have left Caiaphas's palace by at least about 4.30 in the morning. It's a good long ways. It would have taken maybe 10 or 15 minutes at least to have gone from here over to here. And then for the whole trial of Pilate, and it was a lengthy thing, no doubt the trial before Pilate took uh, place approximately around 5, uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. Pilate's permanent quarters were not in Jerusalem, but were in uh, Caesarea, down on the seacoast. But, as was the custom of the uh, Roman uh, governor at these times of feast days, it was his custom to stay in the city of Jerusalem on top of the problem, and the Jews were considered a problem by the Romans. And I don't doubt that Pilate despised every day that he was there, because they didn't think really much of the Jewish people. They were obnoxious. They were a restless lot, and they had a long history of having had riots conducted during these feast days when their nationalities and their nationalism would be brought to the forefront, you know, and their, their religious background and their freedom and all of their independence would have been paraded before them and, and uh, brought to the forefront. There was always a riot. So Pilate saw fit that for the sake of expediency and to, in order to quell any kind of a riot, 
They always were there, it seems, during that period of time, and it seems that he was there for about ten days, a few days before and a few days after this feast. From what we've already gathered, the Jewish people left nothing to chance in the trial of Jesus Christ. They had already secured from Judas where the Lord was going to be at the time of the arrest and what time they should send the soldiers. They had already secured that information from Judas. They had already secured for Judas a band of soldiers and a mob who would come out at a certain time and would arrest the Lord. Third, they had already arranged for false witnesses and had spent a good deal of time arranging this mockery of a trial. Fourth, they had laid a very carefully laid trap for the Lord in this administration of the oath of the testimony. There are four very determined and detailed efforts to have this thing so sewed up that there would be no question about the Lord being arrested and tried and proven guilty. It seems unusual, it seems rather unlikely, that they would let the last step of this trial be left up to just simply chance. And that last very critical part was the final condemnation, the official death sentence by the Roman government. I think you can rest assured that rather than just leaving it up to chance, I think we can draw the conclusion that after Judas had conferred with Caiaphas of, of that night, and Judas left the supper room and went and conferred with Caiaphas and the high priest, that's John the 18th chapter and verse 2, I think we can rest assured that Caiaphas went to Pilate on the Thursday evening prior to the arrest of the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane and there made the arrangements with, with Pilate that he, at least he would give a hearing and that this man would be tried before Pilate in the Roman court early the next morning. It may even be assumed, though it would have to be an assumption, that Caiaphas had, had a guarantee from Pilate that he would give the death sentence against Jesus. We don't have any way of knowing. But nevertheless, I think it would be fairly certain that we could say that there was not left up to chance, that it was not left up to chance that the priesthood of the Jewish people could expect to go by at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and get Pilate up without having made previous arrangements for such a trial to take place. Now, I'm going to ask that we uh, consider that at least, and let me ask you to consider another interesting factor. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, in verse 19, there's one of the most unusual incidents recorded in the Gospels. In the 19th verse of the 27th chapter of Matthew, a woman who is mentioned only one time in the Scriptures is mentioned here in this verse, and it says that while he was sitting, that is, Pilate, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Now, in effect, this woman, whose name is Claudia, she's not named in the Scriptures, but Josephus names her, and other records name her, of course, in the uh, records of the first century as being the wife of, of Pilate. This woman, Claudia, had a nightmare about Jesus Christ the night before he was to be tried. Why? Well, I don't know. The name of Jesus, of course, had been banded back and forth, and it had been pitched here and there probably all that week. And it may be that she was well aware of what was going to happen. But it may very well be, and I'll take the liberty just briefly to reconstruct not only events that we know, but one or two probable events that wove or that are woven into this uh, drama and will give you some idea about perhaps some of the background to this trial before Pilate. For example, we know that Claudia was with Pilate on the night before Jesus Christ was tried. We know that from Matthew the, ninth, the 26th, uh, 27th chapter and verse 19. His wife was with him there in the city of Jerusalem. Second, we know that Judas had left the supper room after the supper and after the washing of feet. He had left the supper room and had made final arrangements with Caiaphas and the high priests about where Jesus Christ was supposed to be, how he was to be pointed out as being this man, Jesus of Nazareth. Judas was going to kiss him. Third, we even know from John the 18th chapter and verse 18 what the weather was on that night. John records that it was cold, cold enough for a fire. And Simon Peter and the soldiers of the Roman army, well, maybe not the Roman army, but the, I'm not, we don't know who, I don't know who they were, just the, the soldiers. There are two kinds of soldiers, the Jewish you know, temple court soldiers and then the Roman soldiers. I'm not just sure right now who these were. But anyway, it was cold enough they were standing around warming their hands around a fire. We know these things. I think it... At least we'll presume this, and we'll surmise that after the final arrangement that uh, Judas made with Caiaphas, and after that part of the arrangements were secured, 
I believe that it's fully logical that Caiaphas went to Pilate after he had met with Judas and made the final arrangements with Pilate in order to secure the trial and perhaps even the death penalty upon Jesus Christ early the next morning. Now, it's surmising, I know, but perhaps it could have happened like this. Perhaps Claudia and Pilate himself were both sitting before a fire, much like Simon Peter and the soldiers were sitting before the fire out in the courtyard at the high priest's house. And if they were sitting there, I don't know whether Claudia knitted or what, I don't know what she was doing, but I suspect Pilate was just twiddling his thumbs. I suspect he'd rather been back down in Caesarea. But then perhaps the soldier came and said, uh, Sir, there's a high priest, the Caiaphas, the high priest, is wanting to see you. So Pilate get up, uh, gets up and goes out and has a conference with this man, Caiaphas, the high priest. He stays out there for a while and makes whatever agreement is to be made and comes back in and sits down. From your knowledge of women, how long do you think it would have been before Claudia said, what was that all about? Well, of course, we're supposing, but if it took place like that, it wouldn't have been very long before she asked him, well, now, what was that about? And Pilate then telling her that it was about Jesus of Nazareth, the Jews are wanting a sentence against him, they are planning to arrest him tonight, and they've asked me to hear the case early in the morning, and that's, and I've agreed to do so. With that on her mind, she went to bed. We know also now for sure that early the next morning, when she awoke about five o'clock, she saw that Pilate was not in bed with her. She hurriedly wrote a note because she knew where he had gone. She, he had gone to the pavement to judge this man. She hurriedly scratched a note on a piece of uh, papyrus or whatever and sent it by a messenger to Pilate and said this, Don't have anything to do with that righteous man. I've suffered many things because of him today in a dream. But it was too late. Little did she realize that while she slept, the Jewish leaders of the people had so securely fixed the death sentence upon Jesus and had so securely fixed a trap for Pilate that neither the Jesus Christ nor Pilate would be able to get out of it. And so Jesus Christ came before Pilate and the guilty verdict was as certain as he was standing there. Pilate, it seems, tried to release Jesus. In fact, the, oh, the 18th chapter and the 19th chapter of, uh, of uh, John indicate and show without any doubt determined effort that Pilate made to release Jesus. I don't know whether, I just can't say that we can't put it all together, but it seems that Pilate perhaps backed down from his former commitment. Uh, I get that impression from when it says, when Pilate sat before them and uh, said to them, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered more or less startled, if this man were not a, an evildoer, we would not have brought him to you. We wouldn't have handed him over to you. But from that point on, Pilate begins then to ask them several questions. He begins to provide certain alternatives. He said, I can provide you with a, a man, Barabbas, or Jesus. I can turn loose whichever one you want. And they said, not Jesus, give us Barabbas. And then uh, he asks over and over, why, what evil has he done? And time and again, it seems that this man, Pilate, tried in a perhaps feeble way to release Jesus Christ because he said, I don't find any evil in him. He said, you take him and judge him by your law. They said, we don't have the right to put a man to death. And he spoke, they spoke that, indicating what death he would die. But so many times, and I don't know, I started to count them and then I, I didn't. But time after time, Pilate tried to release Jesus and uh, let him go free. But the Jewish people would not hear of it. Pilate knew that it was because of envy that they had delivered him up. Mark makes this reference. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, as I said a moment ago, the note from Claudia, his wife, shook him up. And then when he learned that this man should have been put to death by Jewish law because of claiming to be the Son of God, this shook him up still further. But by the beginning of the 19th chapter of John, he had Jesus scourged, the soldiers sensing a death penalty, dressed Jesus Christ up in a scarlet robe, put a crown of thorns on his head, and something like a fishing pole in his hand. And they stood there and mocked him and spit upon him and slapped him and uh, told him to prophesy and so many things that they did to him. And Jesus stood there before the rulers, before the uh, governor, before the soldiers, before the people, and they made fun of him. Finally, Pilate tried one more time to release him, but they came with this final ace when they said, Pilate, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And they referred then back to what Caiaphas had drawn out of the Lord in the trial before the Sanhedrin, when he knew that there was only one basis that would be satisfactory and sufficient 
to secure his death before the Jewish people as a person who was a blasphemer and sufficient enough before the Roman court to accuse Jesus Christ there of treason. And it was this claim to be the king of the Jews. And so finally the trap was sprung, the bait had already been secured, and they stood him there hoping to get the death penalty without maybe pressing to this degree. But finally, the end of the trial was this, when they said, Pilate, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. And when Pilate saw that his neck was being laid on the line, and it was either him or Jesus, Pilate said, all right, take him. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, but the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Mother, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.